Um, I, this is this is my neighborhood. I'm just upstream from these. I'm on a shallow perched aquifer in the in the Capilano sediments. Right, so um, I've watched the water around this area a, a lot. Um, the, the, you only mentioned water quality one bit in your presentation. More of it's in the report, but I'm going to take my opportunity to ask about water quality. Um, volume seemed to be there. Um, it was it was. Uh, this is based on one water sample. Um, well, this exploration well, you had one water sample drawn during the during the pump drawdown. That's what the results show. And there was there was the one number, the uh, sulfur reducing bacteria, that uh, twenty two point seven million number. Uh, and and if you could say something about sulfur reducing bacteria and impact on water quality, and uh, it's not a, a requirement, it's not a health issue, but it does can be, you know, produce uh, yellow specks in the water, and you know there there can be concerns about sulfur reducing. And I don't think anecdotally there is a in the shallow approach in our area sulfur has uh, is in some of the wells and has forced people to dig in other locations in the perched areas. So if you could say a little bit about uh, sulfur reducing, and I'm, I'm particularly interested, I, I'm reluctant to think 8.5 with one, one sample plus two from the first well. Um, so that, that is a, a concern that keeps my jumps just a little bit lower. But yeah, I, I, you know, engineering can, can deal with these issues, but um, the other part of that is the blending. Um, we, we don't have to look past the Flint, Michigan as a, as a very severe issue with uh, changing source water and blending, and uh, it's unlikely to be something on that order of magnitude, but it is, uh, you did note in your report that uh, the blending is something that is important to look at. So yeah, the sulfur and the blending is kind of some of the questions. Uh, thank you. Yeah, water quality. Um, we're pretty confident that we can take more samples. It's not a problem. We can do that tomorrow. Um, but the water quality is really, really, really excellent. Um, it is very similar to the other wells you already have in the same deposits. So the Langdale well, it's the same deposits. It's the same geology originating in Mount Elphinstone that has migrated down between glaciation periods. Um, so I'm pretty confident in the water quality that we might see any more surprises. Um, it was pretty consistent, yeah, across all of those samples. But again, it is pretty easy to sample um, if we do want more of that. The sulfur reducing bacteria is, yeah, it could impact operations and maintenance, but because you're chlorinating the water just 240 meters away, um, you should, and as long as you do use the wells in the winter, you absolutely want to use the wells all winter long, not all not to the same demand, but you want to turn your wells on at least once a day. Um, so as long as you continue to use best practices for when um, I don't see that as a problem. I've seen much, much, much worse. <laughs> So the follow-up would be, um, what, what do we know about the other, like uh, the town of Gibson's, I don't think re regularly samples for sulfur reducing. I don't know if the Landale well is or the Grantham's well or the Chaster well, if there is these other production wells. And as a comparison, as I see the Mahon, if we go back to those results back in January, there was like a 22,000 in the Mahon. So there is, it's, it is, it is present. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just going um, more more data in terms of the, if you're going to accelerate the design, the acceleration of the sampling, I think, uh, would be in, on the books, right? And particularly getting that information from the other surrounding aquifers. So I'm going, I don't know if, if anyone else has sampled for it. It's not a, re a regular thing that is sampled for. So does the regional district sample routinely for sulfur reducing bacteria? I guess that's a staff question. Staff? Do you know the answer to that? Uh, not at this particular time, but uh, what I can commit to is that in um, the future and further work, we will definitely take a closer look and maybe do some additional sampling in, in this one and other wells to to see how they compare and if there is mitigation uh, needed to address any concerns that might arise from that. Thank you. Any other questions for our presenter? No? Excellent. Thank you very much for coming. Um, we do have Annex B here, uh, pages 3 through 152, um, <laughs> half of our agenda package. Um, Remco, do you want to speak more to this? Or?
the visit all here for us. Uh, I can I can a little bit on the report itself. Um, the report primarily provides a high-level overview of uh, the, what is currently already presented, and it compares it to the, um, the water supply deficit as indicated, as um, presented a year ago. Um, at, table, at page three of the report, it indicates that uh, three and uh, Three potential uh, reductions of the water supply deficit based on the effectiveness of our conservation initiatives. Um, currently, uh, we compared to 2010, uh, the reduction is about 13, 14 percent. So, based on current use of the population, uh, developing this well field would reduce our uh, water supply deficit by about 50 percent, which I think is. Uh, is uh, good news. Let's, if to use that word again, um, it's it's substantial, and it's even more than uh, we were expecting uh, based on the results uh, from phase two. So I think that's uh, that's that's uh, that's good. Um, what staff also would like to indicate is that yes, there is a significant. Um, there are additional costs um, compared to the previous uh, estimate. But as indicated by the consultant, the scope of the project has increased. And um, by doing, by increasing the scope, uh, the, the, which would allow us to bring the water actually to the Reef Road Pump Station and as a result all the way to Roberts Creek and uh, into the Seashell area, we think that that's an additional um, uh, value to, uh, to the community in terms of water supply uh, overall. Thank you. Thank you very much. I noticed on you know, looking at the chart on page five of the report or page seven in our agenda package that you know drilling a well is cheap. It's everything that goes with it that's the problem, and or the expensive part. Anyways, I just it was an observation that it's only two hundred thousand dollars to drill a well. That's pretty good. Questions, Director McMahon? Yes, as I learned last week, uh, when we. Um, when we put in a new water main these days, uh, Moji requires us to repave the entire road, which is good news for the residents on Elphinstone Avenue um, who have wanted that road fixed for a long time. But I'm wondering, because as everybody who sits here with me all the time knows, I have a long-standing concern about the safety on Reed Road between North Road and Payne which has become the bypass for the town of Gibsons, whether we like it or not. So if we're going to have to repave half that road anyway, is this an opportunity for us to get in some safe infrastructure, as in a paved shoulder or even a dedicated bike lane? Is there a way to do that? And then if we are putting in infrastructure for uh, alternate transportation, then presumably we could spend some gas tax money on this. So uh, is there a possible another win here? Staff? Uh, thank you for the question, Chair. Uh, there's some pretty exciting synergy uh, given the active transportation goals that the SCRD has uh, has talked about in the past between this project and um, a vision for an improved Reed Road. Certainly something that staff would want to look at uh, should this project proceed. Director Tice. Um Thank you. On um, page... Um, yeah, page 7. Uh, it says considerable cost savings, and you also alluded to it earlier. I'm just wondering uh, uh, what considerable could be um, with uh, working together with the town of Gibsons as well as the other water main that needs replacing. Go ahead. Thank you for the question. Um, we looked at that. Um, Ralph estimate could be anywhere between 200 and 400,000. Uh, yes, thank you. On uh, our agenda package, page five, 
um, is the uh, percent reduction of supply deficit. And um, I believe the figure was um, uh, arrived at by um, calculating how much the well could uh, produce over a year and dividing it into the 2.2 million uh, deficit that we'd stated earlier. Um, but uh, when I did uh, my little spreadsheet, which I don't claim to be accurate, but maybe close, um, I didn't get that figure because you can't, uh, you can't store the water and then use it when you need it in the summer. So uh, you have to, I think you have to figure out the actual flow during those months when we need it. And when I did that, I come up to about 25% of the supply deficit without leaving stage two, um, and, and only a 10% reduction. Uh, but uh, that becomes uh, important in my mind because if I start adding figures into my uh, spreadsheet, it, it says we need three more church wells to actually cover it for the summer. So I, I was wondering, I must be missing something, but I was wondering what that was. Thank you for the question. And uh, I appreciate the efforts by the director to, uh, to come up with the same numbers as, as, as staff uh, prepared. Um, the water supply deficit as included on page two of the report, page four in the package, as presented last year, was a water supply deficit between, here there was a drought period between May 1st and October 31st of the year, of a summer. Um, the, um, the estimates on the percentage of reduction are cal calculated for the same period if the well would run at full speed, well fields would run at full speed between that in that period. Doing so would eliminate the need to reduce to release water from uh, Japan Lake or Atlas Lake during that period. So uh, you're not directly storing the water, but you're you're replacing. Um, you're allowing for water to be restored in a, during a longer period of time. So that's why that's why we came up with the 55 liter, uh, 55 percent. It is an it is an estimate. It of course depends on the actual uh, rain, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, over the summer uh, month. But um, we're fairly confident. We're we're fairly confident that uh, it will be about in that range that it would reduce the water supply deficit during the summer uh, months. Follow up? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that explanation, but I'll perhaps get Remco later on to have a look at my spreadsheet and help me through it. Thank you, Remco. Yes, I would be more than happy to. Right. Director Hiltz, did I see your hand up? Yeah. Excellent, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, uh, thank, th thank for the report and uh, um, the, the the synergies and the economies of scope are, are like just keep coming. Um, so I'm, I'm really supportive of the recommendation. There was the Sons Creek one that tying in that there's another uh, s possible source of using the Sons well as a future project to increase the groundwater flow into the Zone Three. So I, I think that's in the report and that that's great. Um, the one thing I was wondering about is um, is um, involvement of uh, staff of the operators of the uh, water uh, treatment operators from the from the bottom to the top. Um, it, it was there was a part in the it was on page 33. It was about moving barrels of um, uh, sodium hypochlorite. H having been one of those individuals that moves around a 200 kilogram uh, barrel, uh, making those things really easy for people to do. Um, I hope in the design delivery that you, um, as part of the collaboration and outreach of the regional district, to reach out to our own staff and to make sure that those things are as easy as they possibly can because uh, um, doing this once a week, uh, th those are not big drums. You're, you're moving two of me and, and a reluctant move at that, right? So uh, um, I, I really hope that as part of this outreach that you use that cl collaboration and reach out to the operators, both from the blending, the knowledge of the water quality and the operation. So I, I really hope that that's part of the scope of this project. 
I um, I value your concern about our staff and then moving around those barrels. And yes, they are heavy. Um, yes, in, in the design will be such that um, they will be included, and we'll make sure that uh, the input is uh, is included in any design considerations and decisions we make. Thank you, Director Seegers. I have a couple of questions. Um, so this this well would be using power to run the gen the pumps. What do we do for backup in case power isn't available? Thank you, Director. Uh, we do have provisions for an emergency generator pad uh, for that station in the event that backup power does go down. Okay. So then, this is a bigger, bigger question, and you may not be able to answer this at this point, but we are in another conversation talking about reservoirs with a huge price tag. At what point do we start looking at what size the reservoir would be given other sources of water that are coming on board? Ramco? Thank you for the question. Um, which is a good one. I think I, what I would suggest is that we look, take a look at the table presented on page four of the package, uh, page two of the report, which indicates what is the supply deficit for 2025 and 2035. It clearly indicates that even though this well field might uh, reduce the water supply deficit for 2025 by up to 50%. The water supply deficit is expected to continue to grow after that. So I think as, the, as part of the long-term um, planning we're uh, embarking on uh, in upcoming years in terms of uh, what, are, what are the additional um, sources we're, we're looking for to, uh, to meet that 35 uh, deficit. Um, I think that's where uh, the actual determination of the size of the reservoir comes into play. And um, yeah, and I think it also depends on um, the size of the reservoir, uh, of a potential reservoir is of course uh, one one linked with the number of other additional wells we can develop in the meantime, and um, and our other sources, and how the cost of big con construction reservoir of certain size compares to uh, other potential long-term uh, uh, solutions. Hence, uh, the short version is uh, more discussion on this in the upcoming year. So we we are looking at putting budget, like working with our budget, to move more planning with regards to the reservoir forward. And I guess, I guess the question is, at what point in there do we take a shift, depending on what happens with regards to the wells? And is that, it's probably going to be an ongoing conversation that we have through the year, because we don't want to get to the end of the year or into next year and say, well, we've done all this plan and the design for this really big reservoir, and then say, well, but we don't need that big a reservoir and have to go back and rejig some of that. So I'd, I guess I'm just saying, at what point do we, and I guess that's up to you and us to keep our eye on that. I can definitely, I appreciate uh, the consideration you're giving to this, and um, it's it's a, it's a consideration that we as staff also think about a lot. And what we are, um, the next phase uh, the, for the reservoir that we're proposing will uh, provide a, a, the required additional amount of information to really make uh, a better decision on is it even re realistic option or not. Uh, is it even, and I think it will provide the, the, the amount of information to the board for actually to make the decision and to compare it to uh, other options that might be on the table or could be developed. Um, at this point in time, I think it's, um, if you were to compare the, the level of design and cost estimates for that project compared to this, um, this project, this project is way more shovel ready than the other project. Um, 
And that's why I think I'm, I'm recommending to move forward with the next phase of the reservoir project to more precisely uh, see what the actual cost would be and then uh, maybe take a breath and, and see if, we, if, there's a, if there's a desire to move forward at that point in time or put it on hold for a while and first develop some other wells if possible and then uh, see if it can be an option uh, to uh, to develop to uh, uh, meet the 2035 uh, deficit and uh, initiate diverted development and construction uh, after uh, one or two years bonds. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think, yeah, in previous meetings we've talked about that 50 plus million dollar price tag and it's a, a lot to look at. Um, Director McMahon, I saw your hand there. Sure. Uh, I'm liking this, and I'm liking the accelerated schedule, even if it, it does cost a little more. But, you know, we always have the fallback position where we may not succeed in our accelerated schedule. Yeah. One of the many things that I like about this plan is the uh, construction during winter. Because uh, particularly if you're going to be digging up Reed Road in the middle of summer, it would be a particular sort of hell. <laughs> so I think this is... This is a this is a plus. We're going to have to work with Modi uh, a lot on this quite closely because another thing, as you may know, is that we have a big we had a big uh, overland flood in Grantham's just a month or two ago, where Fisher Avenue just about washed out. Mm. So we really want them to manage the um, the the stormwater in this area because it would be very unfortunate if they washed out our water treatment plant. So, anyway. Director Seegers, then Director Tice. Thank you. So then, I'm going to switch to funding. So, we would need to do an AAP. If we want to apply for a grant, we can't actually start any of the construction prior to um, getting funding from a grant. That's kind of what I've read in, inside of what you've said here. So again, those two you have to look at in conjunction as we move forward. Because we may get approval from the AAP um, while we're also applying for grants, if they're available. So that's, I guess, how do we deal with those pieces? Thank you for the question. What we um, what would happen is that if we were successful in receiving a grant, we just would not use the full uh, allowable um, amount for borrowing. Thank you. Go ahead. And I'm going to address uh, Director Ty's question because one of the questions he had earlier was, will the community would the community pr uh, prefer that we wait and get grants? Or not, I think the AAP would probably answer that question for us. Right? They'll either give us approval or not. <laughs> Fair enough. Director Tice? Yeah, well, my question was maybe uh, the wording of the AAP could certainly uh, bring a bit more clarity on that. Um, so th that's something to be cognizant of as, as we create that AAP. Um, the uh, the other comment I had was that uh, I would certainly embrace the plan of reducing our current deficit with wells and then if we ever need a reservoir in the future that things like DSCs uh, pay for that DCCs. or DCCs, yes, DCCs um, uh, rather, than <laughs> rather than our citizens right now. Um, on the, but. Um, the other question I have is uh, in the collection zone right now, um, what activities are permitted that would not be permitted in the future? Um, so just uh, in regards to water quality, I know the highway runs right through there, um, but what other activities are, are currently in that collection zone that uh, may or may not be uh, permitted in the future, if staff knows that? Thank you for your question. You're talking about the development of the water source protection plan yeah. for it as well. Thank you. Um, we haven't done a full analysis 
uh, of that yet. I don't think that there will be major impacts on any current activities. Maybe on future, the future major industrial development upstream in the research zone, maybe that's something that would not be favorable, but there will be no restriction to current use of the area. Thank you for that. Um, I see your hand, but I'm going to ask my question first. Um, and given that the majority of the cost of this $8.2 million is all of the supporting infrastructure, um, roads, hydro, transmission mains, things like that, uh, as staff goes forward with other potential well sites, is that also being considered? Proximity to other you know, substantial infrastructure. I mean, I, I, I think of Great Creek as an example. I can't imagine that the water main out that way is very big. Thank you for um, bringing that forward. Um, one of the reasons why during the phase one of this project, uh, initially we looked at sites that were close to our current infrastructure because of, we knew that the water main expansions are a significant cost. Um, Quake Creek is indeed close to a water main, um, but it will really depend on the potential yield we can uh, we can potentially find there if there would be a need for uh, to upgrade the water main from to get the water actually out of Quake Creek back into the larger uh, uh, mains. And if so, that will be indeed a significant cost. Thank you. On the other hand, the district of Seashell might get some new roads out there. <laughs> Director McMahon? Yes, and at your expense. <laughs> uh, I would like to move the recommendations on page three. All right, seconded. Any other comments, questions, discussions? Director Tice? I, I had a, one more question, and what is, uh, and that is uh, the supplemental flow pipe. Um, is that planned to be above ground or below ground? For the below, below. Okay. Yeah. Director Pratt. Um, I was going to park this one, but um, I might as well ask. Um, uh, during Marta's report, she'd mentioned the possibilities of solar panels in the future. And um, I would just, because this board has a, um, a strategic plan uh, item around uh, climate change and resiliency, um, and then also hearing that 12 new power poles um, to go to this project, knowing um, the, uh, the potential of, um, of power outages that we do see within our community and somewhat within this area as well. Um, I, just uh, just a quick comment on whether or not we could move it as part of or part of the design um, maybe earlier rather than in the future. I see some nodding nods from my technical advisors, so yes, we will include it in our in our uh, in the future phase immediately in the design. I have a sneaky suspicion we'll find out that solar is not going to be anywhere sufficient to support a pumping station. But <laughs> um, I've seen them support a school, so <laughs> much bigger building. <laughs> Director Seegers. Thank you, but maybe less. Um, I don't know. Um, is it? Yeah. So one of one of the moves that's been happening across the province is uh, by BC Hydro is burying power lines. Is that something that is considered or even possible in this area? Because the power lines above ground is what leads to a lot of times your power outages, right? Thank you for the question. We'll, um, as part of the next design phase, we'll uh, consider that. Uh, but we also, in doing that, we'll also consider that uh, burying in existing development is way more expensive than if you do it in new development. Thank you. We end up having to dig up another road doing that. Um, well, while we're digging, we'll see. <laughs> any other comments, questions? I appreciate staff coming forward with the accelerated timeline. I mean, obviously, everybody in the community is eager to get this online and get some resolution happening here. So, all those in favor? Right on. Thank you very much. Um, do we want to take a five minute yes, break? Yes, please. Perfect. Please. Thank you.
Yeah. No, you can't go anywhere, Director Lee. We're gonna we're gonna start back up again here. Uh, Director Hill, Director Hills can join us. Um, moving on to Annex C, uh, pages 153 to 161. Um, staff have offered that they don't have to give us introductions if we're, or information about the reports if we're comfortable with them. So, uh, Director Lee. Um, I'm comfortable with going to the first reading for this one. Um, it is going to be a controversial one at some point, but I'd like to see the um, APC's comments, so I think we need to go to the first reading for that if I've got it right. Uh, I'd like just to hear from staff on that one, though. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Jane. Yeah, that's the correct process, yes. After first reading, the application will be referred to the APC. So I'd like to make the recommend that a motion that we accept the recommendations as made. Perfect. Seconder. Seconded. Any questions? Discussions? All the oh, Director Ties. Um, yeah, um, I just have some questions, and uh, one is, how do the people get from their parking lot down to where they launch the boat with all their stuff? Do they like unload and then have to drive back up and walk down, or? Director. Director Lee? Um, I, I would like to take a chance at answering that question. Um, the, uh, the local residents have already read this recommendation and uh, they have a lot of concerns. And the concerns they have um, are that the uh, proposed boat launching ramp that they're going to use or proposing to use is um, not much of a ramp and the road is narrow and there's people on both sides. And uh, the, uh, the parking lot is within walking distance. So, one, so the assumption is, is that they would back the boat down to the water, launch it, go park the trailer, and then walk back. And so it is within walking distance, so that's realistic. But the... Um, physical road is narrow and long with no turnaround at the bottom and the uh, launching ramp itself is a very informal launching ramp um, so I believe and this is just a feeling we're going to run into some problems uh, with the uh, immediate area residents and the second part of it is is that it's at the end of Lee Road and Lee Road's a very narrow road and um, there's not much appetite to meet a lot of boat traffic, trailer traffic on that road. So, but but this is not my decision. So I think we need to get her to the APC and uh, see what they say. Director Seegers. Thank you. In the uh, report, it also talks about number of parking stalls, and it says uh, indicates 14, because there's two per lot, I guess that needs to be provided. But then it also later on talks about the fact that it will be trucks or vehicles with trailers. So I don't see that in the recommendation here um, or in the bylaw, just that parking has to be provided. And I don't know where in the process we would specify that it would need to be uh, parking for vehicles with trailers. Does staff want to take a crack at that? Thank you, Chair. Um, the report does mention the, the, there will be a need for uh, boat trailers as part of the, the parking lot space. Um, so through, through the next stage of the, the application review, so we can look into the details of the parking lot designs to, if, if necessary, um, extra space could be required to accommodate the, uh, the trailer parking. Thank you. Follow yeah, up. Follow up. Uh, given it's a narrow road and there's no place, I mean, if you look at the picture of the dock, there's little, boat sitting kind of on the side, like they can't park down there and leave their vehicles and their trailers or even just their trailers and their boats down there. So we need to provide, we need to ensure that there's provision for parking in the parking lot for those. And I'm sure the APC will come back to us with comments along that line. Um, any other, Director Tice? Uh, yeah, a couple of things. One is, uh, is there's nothing uglier than a parking lot. So is there uh, any way we can do we can improve the visual and uh, 
and then also can we require charging stations um, for electric charging stations um, as, as part of that so that uh, you know there's some consideration towards uh, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and by requiring it then people will be more incentivized to own electric vehicles and uh, Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Well, then I'd like it. Yeah. So yeah, those are my two questions. Do you want to? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so as far as the visual goes, um, the report has um, e explored a, a possibility of uh, requiring the parking lot to have a internal uh, drive our access only rather than uh, allowing the cars to uh, back onto the road directly um, that will um, minimize the visual impact on the um, public space and also we propose that a, um, a buffer a visual buffer that is made up of a fence or vegetation um, be, um, be installed along the, the edge of the parking lot um, to reduce the, the visual impact. And uh, as in terms of the charging stations, is um, it's not a requirement of the, the zoning bylaw, but we could um, uh, it, it further further explore this idea through the um, through the review process. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, anybody else? No? Okay. Um, voting on the next few items is rural planning, which is A, B, D, E, and F. I'm going to call the question. All those in favor of the recommendations? Carried. Thank you very much. On to Annex D, which is a frontage waiver in electoral area F. Director Hiltz. Um, yeah, yeah, I am supportive of the recommendations. I just have one, one question of staff. And it's on uh, page 163, and uh, it's uh, Modi has no concern. So I, I'm assuming that that means that there's a preliminary uh, layout approval already submitted on, on, on this area. So I'm just verifying. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the preliminary layout approval has not been finalized, but through the previous uh, conversation with uh, MOTI, they are supportive of the layout of the subdivision. And, and, and the design of the proposed road. Thank you. Director Hiltz? Yes, I'm happy to move the recommendations as presented. Great. Seconder? Seconded. Any further discussion, questions? Co Director McMahon? I'm just once again airing my longstanding uh, <coughs> opposition to sprawling into areas that do not have services, and, and especially fire protection. And I'm going to add, because I've been spending a lot of time looking at roads lately, that all of the roads in the rural areas are maintained by Modi, which clearly does not have the budget to maintain the roads. And so adding more roads in remote areas that are going to have to be maintained over the long haul does not strike me as a good idea. So I'll be voting against this. Go ahead, Director um, I, I'm going to share those comments with, with Director McMahon. Um, I, I do have those ongoing concerns, um, and I am going to support it. Um, the proponent has moved it forward. Um, I'm looking for a way in the future that this isn't uh, you know, ultimately the market's going to decide if this can be bought and sold. Um, but yeah, I, I do have those ongoing concerns. Um, but uh, it, it seems to be that this is the uh, there is a risk to not going forward in terms of the regional district at this point. So um, I think all the boxes have been checked, and there really isn't a lot of uh, options. And that's kind of where I have seen it go. Okay. Ready for the question? All those in favor? Opposed? Would you like that recorded? Sure. Okay. Moving on to Annex E, Development Variance Permit, uh, Electoral Area E. Would you like to speak to that? Sorry, I'm just scrolling desperately here. Uh, where are we? Page 160. 
1966. Yeah, uh, there are no issues with this. This has been to the APC. It's pretty straightforward, so I'm happy to move the recommendations on page 166. Seconder? Seconded? Any further comments, questions? All those in favor? Great, that's carried. Thank you. Um, Annex F, page 172, uh, Development Variance Permit Area A. Director Lee. Uh, yes, I'd like to um, make a motion to accept the recommendations as presented. Um, it's a pretty straightforward one. Seconded. Okay. Any questions? Director Hills. Uh, yeah, I did have a question. Um, it's on page 174 that this, this application went to the Board of Variants. And I, I had a question. Is, is there a, a, a record of that Board of Variants meeting accessible to the public in terms of uh, minutes on the website? I was just trying to find out, is there, is there a record of this in the public domain? Um, thank you for the question. The minutes should be uh, available and posted on our website uh, for the public. And staff can further confirm that that is true and correct. Um, I do have a question about um, what is the Board of Variants? I, I know that it was when, what happened, it went before the Board of Variants and they said this isn't theirs to look at, so they pushed it back to us. But I was kind of curious what a Board of Variants was. Thank you for the question. Um, the Board of Variants is a um, appointed by this board and is a separate legal tribunal in the province of BC with the authority to consider variances to provisions in our zoning bylaw, um, particularly where they um, present a hardship to the owner. The board is the uh, defines what is determined as a hardship. Uh, the applicant it is, uh, has to a state exactly what their hardship is in their rationale for the variance, uh, and then the board in its uh, in its discussion can determine whether or not uh, they feel uh, that the hardship is warranted and uh, can make their decision based on that fact. Go ahead. Follow up question on what, what is the board of variance? What's its uh, makeup? In a population of our size, which is any population under 30,000 people in the province of BC, the Board of Variance is made up of three individuals uh, appointed uh, by, by the board. Uh, they tend to, uh, um, the duration for which they sit is based on our terms of reference that we would establish here at, at the district. Director Tice. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat wondering is you know we, we have these rules and uh <laughs> and yet you know when somebody messes up and and, and makes a mistake um then we can bend those rules and uh so why why are the rules there um so and, and where does the mistake lie that's that's my question uh, if the if the mistake lies on the owner's side then um i don't know if we should be voting for this It's not 100% clear where the, where the mistake was made, but it seems like somebody poured the foundation and said, hey, let's, uh, oh, looks, looks like we overlooked this. And so, where was the mistake made? Does staff have an answer to that? Uh, thank you, Chair. Just keeping to a, a general answer, um, in cases where some kind of mistake has been made, staff are always careful to look at each case on the basis of its merits and to take the argument back to uh, a consideration of planning factors and that was the that was the process applied in this case thank you for that um anybody else no director lee um i could uh, i did walk with the apc onto the site uh, they went and checked it out and saw exactly what happened. Um, the the owner had went with a recommendation of um, a surveyor, and so they put stakes down and they poured cement and then they made a design and did the whole thing, not realizing that the overhang was the end of the setback, not the foundation. And now what they what they did is that the whole roof don't 
uh, approach the lake too close, it's a chunk of it, just a little pointy part of it. And when you look at the uh, site itself, um, it's on a rock, and any of the vegetation is way closer to the lake. So they, they were quite careful. Uh, but the um, RAPC later on, we'll see where they've uh, asked to have more information about setbacks and what causes them and stuff so they can make better decisions, but that's something later on. But the our APC is pretty pretty tight on this, and they asked the same question that uh, Director Ties did. So, and I have seen them turn it down. So, so I am quite comfortable with this one, going with their recommendation. Great. Uh, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Perfect. Carried. Thank you very much. Um, Annex G. We're on G, right? Uh, Annex G, uh, Provincial Referral for Private Mortgage, Electoral Area B, page 207 of our agenda package. Do you want to speak to it? Yes. Uh, just a question for staff before uh, going through the recommendations. Um, when will this be coming in front of the APC? Because I noticed it wasn't on the last agenda. Thank you for the question. Uh, this uh, referral is scheduled to come to the APC in January. And the, um, the referral, um, it's because the referral uh, from the province has already, that timeline has already closed. So I just, uh, and I, I know that the one from Kellerman was around the same kind of schedule and um, we were able to get that on the last month's APC, but not, not Bessie's. So I was just wondering if it was just a timing type issue or just a question there. Thank you. The, um, yes, a timing issue, volume of mortgage reports simultaneously. Okay, and I'm um, prepared to move the recommendations that are on page 207. Perfect. Seconded. Thank you, Director Lee. Uh, any other questions? Co Director Hiltz. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to hook together the, uh, the, the section of best practices and uh, page 118. So best practices says uh, gangway should be 1.2 meters. This is... 1.5 meters. Um, the timber frame is 400 square feet, so say over 20 square meters best practices. Under over 20 square meters is get referred to DFO. I'm, I'm just, how do those pieces fit together? Like in, um, the applicant is, proponent is to follow best practices and their document co clearly shows them not following best practices. So I'm just wondering, is, is that a comment that uh, the, the regional district should make is that these specifications of the doc do not make, meet best practices? I'm just wondering how those pieces fit together. What, what is the due diligence on the part of the regional district to verify that best practices are followed, I guess is the question. Staff, please. Thank you. Uh, staff have currently made a recommendation, it's listed as 2B, that the proponent implement provincial and Seashell Nation best management practices um, and have specifically identified two other areas where this particular uh, mortgage application is not aligned. Um, further recommendations are welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Hall. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just to build on the planner's comments, um, and uh, staff spoke about this at a previous uh, committee meeting, the, the regional district is cautious about stepping into matters that are provincial jurisdiction and um, uh, is working with provincial staff to clarify what the most impactful uh, points are that can be uh, provided to the province, but ultimately, staff feel and we've gotten a positive response at a staff level from the province that um, in matters of design and in matters of application of best practices that are the province's best practices they are the authority and by us um, pointing them out in a recommendation uh, as included in the package here um, uh, the regional district is responding to the community's interest in, in seeing in seeing the province uh, 
fulfill its own requirements. Thank you for that. Um, Director Lee? Uh, just a comment. It says should, not must. So uh, the province occasionally will ask for um, QP reports if they're concerned, but uh, that happens later on. So I think uh, pointing it out is about the best we can do. Right. Okay. Uh, nobody else? No? Okay. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Annex H, Provincial Referral for a Private Merge, Electoral Area A. Director Lee, do you want to say anything to this, being your area? Um, no, I'm, uh, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, accept the recommendations as presented. It's um, pretty straightforward and it's up in Captain Island outside Pender Harbor. Okay, seconder. Seconded. Um, any questions, comments? Give everyone a second. No? Call the question. All those in favor? Great. Lights carried. Thank you very much. Annex I. Um, provincial referral for a private merge. Electoral area B. Director Pratt. Uh, hi. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, I went with the APC when they did the did the tour um, of this uh, uh, project or the proposed um, dock with the proponent, and um, there's uh, and I, I noticed like the AP and then it, it, attending the APC later that day, the APC has um, has a different recommendation going forward because. Um, there's some thoughts that rather than doing, um, asking the proponent to do a new application, that maybe if the proponent can mitigate, um, like if there's a couple more steps in there, there is the cement um, boat launch that is fairly shallow and is um, typically is covered in driftwood um, for the majority just because of the way the bay is. So it's, it's almost constantly unusable anyways but there was a suggestion of if that ramp is removed then that only then that brings it back to zero mortgage for that and and um, and then maybe this application can move forward rather than having to stop mitigate those um, mitigate the uh, the other ramp and then move forward with a new application um, so I mean because there's there's obviously time involved with doing that, as well as, I would assume, an additional cost going through a whole new application process. Um, so I'm wondering if you can comment, if staff can comment on the potential of, rather than doing the not approve or not support the application, uh, doing it with additional conditions. Staff. Staff have been in touch with provincial staff about this application, and that oh, our understanding is that would be at the discretion of the provincial decision maker. Director Lee, um, I think uh, I support uh, Director Pratt in that. I would uh, rather see a condition put on this that uh, we recommend the uh, the uh, ramp, launching ramp be removed uh, as part of issuing the license and that uh, leave that to the provincial government. But our recommendation, I think we, we can make a recommendation, take the ramp out and let nature restore it, which it will. And. Uh, there's a lot of these old uh, these old uh, launching ramps around, and I think it's definitely beneficial to take them out and let nature restore it. So, uh, I would m my comments when I read it was, I think the right thing to do would just simply be, yeah, we support the application, providing they take the darn ramp out, <laughs> or something to that in a little more official language. Mm -hmm. But is is staff comfortable with that? Is that a possibility that we could do that? Mr. Hall. 
Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll provide some comments and then may ask my colleagues with more technical expertise to jump in if I don't cover this correctly. Um, to answer the Director's question, uh, the Regional District is asked to choose from a menu of options in responding to the referral. We can choose whatever option uh, the, the Board wishes. Um, the, the, this complexity of having a second mortgage facility um, from staff's perspective is a, it's a matter of a provincial policy. The applicant in making application to the province did not um, reference that in, there was an existing facility uh, there. And so that's a, that's, a, and to add complexity and bring in an element that happened outside of the provincial process, staff were later provided and understand the APC was also provided with a report from a biologist suggesting that removal of the existing mortgage facility may not be the preferred environmental option. And staff understand that works in, the work to remove uh, an existing facility would require a separate provincial approval. And so we're careful in framing the recommendations as they are to, um, I suppose, give the province uh, notice that there's an expectation that the existing policy be applied here in whatever way the province uh, would like to see that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Director Sevier, I saw your hand up. Do you still have a question? No, I was going to redo this, but I have to think now. Director Pratt. I think um, for me, because the uh, the APC comments are being provided as part of the um, as part of the notes, and um, we have our staff technical information as well as the um, the additional information. And yes, I had, sorry, I had forgotten about that environmental report that was provided at the APC as well, uh, which was additional information that was not because I was the conduit that it got to staff. So um, it's. Um, um, I'm, 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 I'm okay with um, supporting staff's recommendations as long as we're ensuring that the APC commission represent, uh, uh, position as well is in there, and um, and so that it has that that wholesome uh, view. So, Director Severs, and that point three in the recommendation. Right, that, yeah. that that's going forward. So, yeah, okay. I get so it. I'm happy to move those recommendations then. Okay. Seconded? Yes. Seconded. Go ahead with your question, Director Hiltz. Um, um, the APC's comments, um, this idea of, of that the recommendations be more punchy, I guess, more direct, opposed to, was there something in particular, they, they did not support the application, is that? Wasn't um, they? They supported the application, but only if the ramp was removed, and um, and then there was the additional, um, the additional piece of the uh, environmental assessment, you know, about removing the ramp. The the concrete ramp is, uh, like I said earlier, is is fairly unusable due to wood, um, but you can clear it out and still use it. So it, it does need to be some mitigation needs to be done with that. At the end of the day, we're not, as staff said, we're not the approval, we're just port putting on the referral. And um, I'm happy to support the technical recommendations from staff because they're more technical as well as, because I think the Advisory Planning Commission balances that out with the uh, the view of the community. So, um, so I think between the two, the provincial body will um, will accept what uh, and approve what they see best fit. Follow up. Um, would, would putting something in in that point in the in the third point more specifically draw attention to the report? That's what I'm wondering. Is kind of not to hit them more directly with the recommendation that the APC is putting forward. More words around that to emphasize. That is that would that help? Um, I having. I'm oh, sorry. May I? 
<laughs> so I guess that would be a question for staff. When you bring in the report from the, or the comments from um, any other referral agencies that we put this out to, do you say, you know, it is, and like, we may not support this recommendation as the SCRD. However, the Community Area Planning Commission supports it for this reasons and believes this needs to happen. Like, is that how it's said within... Um, within the report that goes back to the province? Thank you for the question. Uh, staff don't provide any additional interpretation after each uh, set of resolutions are received. So both the board and the APC resolutions are provided direct to the ministry. Director Lee. I should know better than not to read these things in detail. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually stated in the uh, third paragraph on number two that any updated or future application is recommended to ensure that the provincial policy of maximum of one mortgage facility per property is maintained. So it's, it's actually quite clear that uh, um, they need to do some more work. <laughs> and we're recommending they do some more work. Clear enough for me to call the question? Yeah. All those in favor? Perfect. That's carried. Thank you very much. Moving on to Annex J. We're almost on page one of the agenda. <laughs> um, agreement renewals, Pender Harbor Living Heritage Society sublease for Sarah Ray Hall. Director Lee. Um, yes, this is uh, usually uh, quite a routine uh, uh, matter except that for this year we're doing a little bit of extra work on the um, asset management side of it. So um, the two years instead of five years is the explanation for that. Uh, so um, I would uh, make a mess, uh, motion to accept the recommendations as made. Um, seems like it's the prudent way to go to me. Uh, I wouldn't mind if staff could comment though on that a little further on the two years versus right. five. Let's get a seconded first. Perfect. Thank you very much. Staff? Uh, thank you for the question, Chair Toth. Uh, so SCRD plays something of a facilitator role in this relationship and we're, we're sandwiched in the middle between the school district as owner and the Pender Harbor uh, Living Heritage Society as the, the operator. And um, uh, there are incoming accounting standards which may lead to the need to record liabilities relating to this site because of our role in the middle. And so in light of those and um, always looking for more streamlined uh, ways of meeting community needs, uh, staff requests that um, while we want to, while we recommend that uh, um, we continue with service to the community by maintaining our role as facilitator, but um, that staff have some uh, an opportunity to come back in a couple of years prior to these new accounting standards coming in just to ensure that um, the interests of all parties are being uh, met as effectively as possible. Thanks. Great. Director Pratt, did I see your hand up? Um, I was just wondering if we should send us to board today because the uh, it it expires on the 31st of December. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for the question, Director. Staff are always cautious in adding those clauses, um, given that appearing on a on a board. Uh, agenda gives public notice of a, of a decision to be made mm. and the parties are aware that this is being dealt with and feel comfortable with the process so uh, staff don't feel it's necessary thank okay. you thank you director mcmahon then director hiltz i just want to say how much fun it is to vote on uh, an agenda item with a budget implication of 15 dollars Got to love the cheap budget items. Yeah. Director Hiltz? Yeah, my, my question is on, on page uh, two, 291, number five, and uh, it says all taxes. And I'm, I'm guessing that this is just a standard clause, but I'm, I'm also assuming that this is a, a property tax exempt property, being school board property. So just is that uh, 
I'm verif verifying it's a tax exempt property and this is just a standard clause or just squaring those. Do you know that offhand? I apologize, Chair. I, I don't know that offhand. The director's assumption seems reasonable. Thank you. Director Seegers. The province determines permissive tax exemptions in the regional district. Right? In, in the municipality, it would, when it comes to us, uh, it doesn't matter who owns the property, it's the usage. So we have properties that are um, owned by a church, for example. Not the whole property will get the permissive tax exemption. Depends on the use of the, pro of the buildings or whatever. So I, I think the province would look at that as well for in this case. And it would depend on whether or not it would fit their criteria. Director Hiltz, follow up. Yeah, I remember from UBCM there was a, a resolution about legions that came up that regional districts can do their own tax exemption. So I was just wanting to make sure that this property is tax exempt. So um, that that was my, my question is, if it's not, we probably should make it sure that it is tax exempt, that the province isn't doing it. That's, that's where the question was coming from. So I'm not sure how, if, if staff just needs to verify that or... Um, is it a can of worms that should not be opened, or um, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Staff, take note of the question and can provide more information. This will be coming back at least one more time, so you can get your question answered at that point. Um, Director Lee. I do believe it's tax exempt. I don't remember them ever paying tax, so. Um, but is this coming back again? It, not for two years, right? Oh, well, we got to come to the board yet. Yeah. No, okay. That's why I asked the question. Thank you. I'm going to turn my microphone on first. Um, anybody else? Last call? No? Call the question. All those in favor? Great. Carried. Thank you very much. Um, go on page two of the agenda. I can actually turn the paper over now. Um, Annex K, page 316 of our package, uh, Agamemnon Channel, Daniel Point Park, foreshore license renewal. Um, does staff want to say anything about this? Or? There you are. Director Lee? Director Lee can speak. I just recommend, uh, I'd like to pass a motion that we accept the recommendations as presented. It's, um, it's a $200 item. And it, uh, it ensures that no one's going to build within that uh, water zone and mess it up for users of the park. So it's uh, quite a reasonable um, insurance policy. <laughs> All right, seconded. Seconded, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, this is community parks, uh, A, B, D, E, and F. Any questions, comments? Oh, Director McMahon. Yeah, I appreciate the staff raising the issue of marine debris because that's an increasing issue in the area. I was just curious because uh, we have a foreshore lease, uh, a very uh, extensive one in Area E. And I was wondering, and I was getting to understand that that was unique, but we have a foreshore lease here. So uh, are they different? Staff? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, staff don't, haven't evaluated whether there are any differences at all, but the, um, the type of instrument and the scope of uh, application are more similar than different. Thank you for that. Uh, any other questions? No. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Um, Annex L. Uh, RFP 19399 Youth Center Services Contract Award Report. Um, this is voting all because it's regional recreation. Director Seegers? I'll move the recommendations as presented. Perfect. Seconded? Seconded. Any questions, comments? Director McMahon? Yes, I'm going to raise this later, but um, we have not established service levels for recreation. And uh, it's what I would view as an optional expenditure, but represents a lot of tax money. And so I'm not comfortable at this point review, like passing multi-year contracts when we have not reviewed the service levels. That's my comment. Director Hiltz? 
Um, thank, thanks, Chair. Um, the the multi-year and the service level, yeah, um, it is a service provided. And, and so the question that I had for staff is, I, I don't know, I believe we have, don't typically get reports back on um, what's happening there. Um, and I believe that the new contract has this requirement for reporting back. Is a 12 individuals seems to be kind of a low number. So I'm assuming that there's more capacity within this building to have more youth involved. So it's the, the number of youth and the reporting back, and, and this might tie in with the service level, I think, is the, the reporting back. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, <laughs> Director. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Um, staff, staff provide aggregate patronage figures for facilities through quarterly reports, and will sometimes pull out uh, key information received from individual programs. Um, yes, there is more capacity in the Gibsons and Area Community Center for programming. And um, this youth center program is, is only one of many programs that take place in the building, um, even that support youth. And uh, more, the, the committee recently requested additional information about parks and recreation um, through some reports that will come forward as part of round two budget, and I believe also uh, a lunch and learn. Uh, to provide additional background, and staff are preparing those. Thanks. Thank you very much. Does that satisfy your not quite a question? Perfect. Um, <laughs> uh, any other questions, comments? All those in favor? Opposed? Would you like that recorded? Sure. Sure, okay. Annex M, um, page 322, request for proposal uh, RFP 1934501, Halkett Bay Dock Upgrade Repairs. Does any questions? Anybody want staff to say anything? Director Tice. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm happy to move the uh, staff recommendations if I understand it correctly. That is uh, to uh, to do the work without uh, rebuilding the shed and, and without painting the handrails. Is that correct? Uh, I think that's the prudent way to go. And uh, so I'll, I'll move staff's recommendations. And I see a seconder. Director Hiltz? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm supportive of the recommendation. I, I think staff is balancing all of these aspects. And the, que the question I have for staff is, is removing the shed a reduction in service level? Like this is, I'm wondering about that. And um, uh, that's the first question. Uh, thank you for the question, Chair. Yes, if the if the shed was removed and not replaced, it would be a reduction in service level. And the conversations that staff have had with the community are that if it would be replaced, or, or sorry, if it would be removed, then it would be replaced. And uh, at such future time as that happens, staff would be looking for the most cost-effective way to accomplish that. Thank you. Follow-up? Uh, a follow-up. Um, I'm going to just give a little background on this particular dock. Um, um, in, in 2007, when uh, Firk and Plateau started uh, to do the development, uh, they were Part of that development was to be serviced by a private dock on Long Bay known as Long Bay Dock. Um, that dock and approach turned out to be unusable for the development. So the load on this facility has increased by about 120% from 40 lots to adding another 60 to 79 lots um, through the development process. Um, that uh, parcel, the, uh, the slope of the approach to it, uh, averages 20 20% slope. Um, and it peaks around 30% slope. So this is what uh, the community who bought into this thought that they would be using. And, and just for comparison, um, the bypass is less than 8%. Um, what do I got? Dusty Road is 11 average with a maximum of 20 to 25. This is a very steep situation that was approved by Modi. It's a Modi road. It became unusable. And now the regional district is having to take on the load of this community 
putting an increased load on this dock. So it's just something that this offloading and inadequate development or um, uh, development of this dock, which was sold as, a, as the asset, and then the road to connect into the Halkett Bay only came after a certain threshold had been realized in this development and they cannot bring supplies in. So it was just an interesting situation of how it developed over time from a, it became a kind of a sales point and now it's uh, the regional district is having to support that uh, servicing it to these private properties. So yeah, I am, I'm supportive of the, of the document, of the recommendations. Thank you for that background. Um, port services, voting B, D, E, and F. Uh, any other questions, comments? No, all those in favor? Great, it's carried, thank you. Uh, Annex N, uh, vehicle replacement award recommendation. Um, any questions? This one, in the agenda review we discussed, because it's split across two services with different participants, um, voting will be all for this one. Um, any questions? Director Ties. Well, I usually Director McMahon has the honor of asking this question, but <laughs> I'll, I'll do it this time. Um, how do these vehicles score in, in fuel economy and greenhouse gases? And it looks like they're new. And uh, granted, there aren't really too many options of um, uh, fully electric and uh, fuel efficient uh, trucks out there. Um, but uh, has that consideration been part of the uh, evaluation of choosing the vehicles? Thank you, Chair. Uh, the Evaluation Committee looks at uh, many um, parameters when assessing these vehicles, of which gas mileage is. Unfortunately, three-quarter ton trucks with service bodies don't get that great of mileage, but um, it's required uh, tool for the staff. Yeah, and unfortunately at this time, we're, you know, I think the electric options are zero on the market, so it is what it is, but hopefully next time, right? Um, any other questions, comments? No. Director Seeger? Move the recommendations. Okay. Seconded. All those in favor? Great. Thank, um, Director McMahon, are you opposed? I didn't see your hand. I'm waffling over here. You can, you can ignore me. I didn't <laughs> vote. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, Annex O, uh, 2020 BC Council of Forest Industries Convention. Um, I can sure. Uh, so um, I attend. This is a conference that I attended last year, um, and uh, Mayor Beamish did att attend as well. Um, it was uh, last year was held in Vancouver. Uh, this year is being held up in Prince George. Um, I thought um, I asked it to get put on the agenda just because um, wanted to offer it. If any, there's one night free accommodation plus the conference free uh, for one member of our regional district um, or a mayor from the municipalities, they get the same invitation. Um, it's a valuable conference to learn more about the forest industry. It was a great opportunity to get face to face with Minister Donaldson um, and uh, find out that he did know who I was. So um, it's, uh, I just, I wanted to put it out there if anybody wanted to attend. Um, I'm not sure whether or not I can make it in my schedule but um, I'd like, you know, if anybody wants to, it's a, it's just, it's a neat conference. Thank you for that. Anybody want to go? It's a long way. It is a long way. It's up in Prince George this year. Yeah. No? I mean. There's a direct flight. <laughs> One night's accommodation and um, and the registration fee for the conference is covered by Kofi, um, and then so additional hotel and getting up there if the board wants to support someone going there would be covered by the board. So, Director McMahon, if Director Pratt thinks it's a valuable opportunity and wishes to go, I'd be willing to support that. But I personally do not want to go to Prince George to this conference. 
Same. <laughs> Director Seegers. Okay, so we could approve Director Pratt going, and if it works in her schedule, she can go, and if not, that can come back and somebody else can take her place inside because the the um, registration can be transferred yes. typically yes okay so i'll put director pratt's name in there and move the recommendations i'll second the recommendation um director hills did you want to speak still um, yeah I, I just remember um, last year when this came back before the board and uh, at that time i recall it being the first time that people could remember this being offered so this is kind of a, a recent thing and and that discussion went about the perception of a, a lobby group paying for someone to go there that was kind of the discussion that was around the table last year and and so we're back here again and this time it's in prince george rather than vancouver so a little bit more significant investment i think bill beamish only attended the day he didn't stay overnight um so yeah this is uh, the second time around and uh, from what I understand, this is only the second year that the Kofi has offered this incentive to intend. Director Lee, you had your hand up? You're okay? Director Seegers? We're, we're getting invited to a lot of these different types of conferences, and we have competing interests and competing um, agendas on the Sunshine Coast. We do hear a lot from the you know Elphinstone, you know logging focus the different groups that don't want us to cut down trees we need to have the other side presented to us as well and it doesn't get presented here very well from what i what you know my experience so this we have to see both sides so i'm yes they're they're paying for part of it they don't pay for the whole conference um director pratt would have to look at the agenda and see you know what she what benefit she'd see from going to the whole conference Director Pratt. Um, so because of the, um, there's a number of ministers that do attend this, um, as well as I got face-to-face -face with about five BCTS workers uh, in the in the groups, and um, uh, which is, so it's about, there's some relationship building there as well. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm happy to to go or to stay, depending on my schedule, or someone else to go or stay, um, or to not. It's um, it's up to really essentially up to the will of the board about the additional costs. Director Hiltz, um, kind of where I'm, I'm supportive of, of someone going. I, what I'm also supporting is that the SRD pay it. That's kind of how I would prefer to see it's, it's, you know, in terms of the greater $40 million budgets, it's a small cost, but uh, I think there's some independence in there that, uh, so from a perception point of view, I'd be more supportive of the SRD paying the whole shot is kind of the way I'd be thinking about it. I've got Director Lee, Director Kroll, Director Seegers, and then Director McMahon. I'd be very... I'd be very supportive of uh, Lori going. Um, she, she can continue her relationship building with the minister. Uh, we will have a very good relation with all ministers pretty soon. So <laughs> and I think uh, it's very important to, to get both sides of the discussion. It's, it's, uh, so when we do have to make decisions, it's cool. And we are asking things of them such as land use planning. So I think the relationship building is very important. So I'd be supportive. Director Kroll. I'm sort of going along with what Director Lee was saying. I think there's a benefit in um, maintaining the same representation from the district board with the group. Um, there's a bit of continuity. Conversations can be, you know, for someone else to have to start afresh is probably not as beneficial to the to the board so i would certainly recommend if um, director pratt is able to attend that she do director seegers thank you um my understanding is that kofi in past i think last year was the first year that they actually paid for a day for governments to government officials to come prior to that if government officials could make it they went on their own dime um, there is an acknowledgement that a lot of the uh, municipalities where forestry is a big part of their budget, 
they've been having some difficulties. And it's not only impacted the businesses, but it's impacted the governments as well. And they still want to retain those relationships. And so they, they started offering this as a, an incentive to allow it to be more cost effective for um, elected officials to attend. So that's where the one day comes of the whole conference. If you want to go to the whole conference, you still have to pay for the rest, but one day just to kind of get face time. Director McMahon, do you want to still talk or can we call the question on it? Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it being subsidized. Um, we keep making decisions on travel um, at piecemeal, and I wouldn't mind as part of the budget process this year uh, kind of laying out a, a travel budget for the board so that we can have an organized approach. L last year, we went out at piecemeal because we were all new, and we didn't really know what the the cost benefit analysis was, but I think maybe it's time for us to look at it in a slightly more organized fashion. Director Sears? I think there's two pieces to what you're referring to there. One is we do have a budget for travel. So there is an amount. This is the piece that actually gets somebody paid. So unless we actually, do you remember how we came back and we did all those extraordinary meeting, yeah. right? So it's, this is actually somebody going gets paid to go. Otherwise, they can't actually submit their expenses. And there is a budget. Okay. Follow there, up. There is a budget, but we've never sat down and said, you know, what would it cost for me to go to this, 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 and this? Right? What, what, what's the bottom line? And if we all go to all of these things, then, then do we meet our budget? And so I just think that we should look at that. I'm less concerned about the stipends. I'm more concerned about the travel costs. Can you talk to staff? CEO Brown. Uh, so yes, thank you for the opportunity to share it. Um, just to make a way in, there's uh, a couple of questions that I hear. And also, uh, just to remind the board that we're looking at the compensation bylaw, a remuneration for the elected officials at the table here. And I think we'll keep this in mind as far as um, covering off these so-called one-offs that pe that the directors have to retroactively approve is to come up with a bylaw that is more all-encompassing for these types of um, conferences that the board is attending. Secondly, I'd like to say that um, I think uh, what I hear the director saying is that um, given that you now have a year under your belt, is to look at what was expended in, in 2019. Um, and to see basically value for money, I suppose, for attending these various conferences now that you have attended them. And um, we could provide that report at a later meeting. Director Pratt. Yeah, and, and just to follow up on that, and, um, and, and it's the whole concept of professional development as an elected official, um, because there might be you, um, uh, there might be some conferences that you know if you attend LGLA and and you just it's it, you know it's not your thing but you see another conference that you'd like to attend um, like looking at a potentially a professional development budget per director or as a whole as a board so or if there's you know certain uh, certain uh, board um, I'm going to say deficiencies um, <laughs> where you know like maybe we might have some that want more information or you know, on certain things to become a better elected official um, that are outside of our mandate. And is that something that we can look at with the CAO as well? I think staff will come yeah. back with something. Perfect. All those in favor? Perfect. That's carried. <laughs> Sorry. We still have a few items and a closed meeting and lunch. Um, Annex P, uh, page 334, uh, Islands Trust and SCRD joint meeting. Um, motion to receive the minutes because we didn't actually receive the minutes. Oh, sure, yeah, we can receive all of the minutes. So that's um, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W. Moved, seconded, all in favor? Okay. Um, anything arising from Annex P that anybody wants to flag? We need to move those. We need to move those recommendations. In oh, okay. Annex P. Okay. Um, is that a motion to move them then? Uh, sure. I'll make a move. Uh, a motion to move all the all the recommendations in Annex P. Seconded. Comments? Nothing. All those in favor? Great. 
um, Annex Q, um, page 338. Okay. Anybody have anything there they want pulled out for discussion? No? I didn't move them. Received them all. So. Yeah, okay. So we're good on that one. Um, annex R. Anything there? Director Seegers? Uh, there's a, one recommendation there, recommendation number two, that we may want to uh, consider endorsing. Page 342. Would you like to move that? Sure, I'll move that. I'll second that. <coughs> Any comments? No? Invasive, I mean, the invasive species, plants, etc., has been raising its head again on the coast here. Uh, there is an acknowledgement that we don't really have a place to dispose of them. So it's just a, it's a conversation that we need to raise and, and, I mean, continue to raise awareness in the community. GM Hall. Uh, thank you, Chair. The regional interjurisdictional invasive plant strategy was um, sent as a referral to uh, all of our advisory groups and staff will be reporting back on a summary of what was heard through the referral process along with uh, further recommendations so while the committee is welcome to to um, move a particular recommendation in any of these minutes should they wish it will be coming back uh, on its own thank you director Pratt um, one of the things that came up uh, with uh, Area B, of course, was the um, uh, uh, resourcing and budgeting around that as well. Will that be part of the staff report? The answer that was yes. Thank you. Um, Director Hiltz. Um, on page 343, um, this came up at the Agricultural Committee in terms of uh, rainwater rebates and um, the pond discussion that whether ponds are eligible for rainwater uh, rebates um, and uh, no one in the AAC knew that ponds were a possibility and is the uh, the rebate application specifically seems to re reference cisterns rather than ponds so I'm, I'm just wondering from a staff point of view in terms of making it clear that the rebate is it isn't just for cisterns, it's any kind of collection mechanism. So I'm just wondering, from staff's point of view, what, what needs to happen with that, uh, pushing that information out to the, particularly the farmers. My understanding is that the rebates are only on residential systems, but staff? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Chair. We don't have um, conservation program staff here with us so unfortunately I, I can't answer the question but um, the planning staff who are here take note of the point that's raised uh, here and a request for more information and we'll be following up great thank you um, we do have a motion on the floor for the invasive species recommendation to be pulled and endorsed got a question on it all those in favor okay um, so um, Annex S, yeah. Um, rather than go through them one by one, those that know their areas best, do they have any that they would like to pull from S, T, U, V, or W? Director McMahon. I just want to note that the Area E APC had a lot of questions about private roads and would uh, like to understand better the implication of, of private roads going in, uh, what, what are best practices, if there are best practices around private roads, and what are the uh, experience in, of the SCRD, because I certainly know that shared driveways uh, do not necessarily make happy neighbor relations. Um, I've heard a lot of that. So um, I thought the APC could use some education, but probably all the rural directors could as well to understand that. Like to see that as a lunch and learn, maybe, or something to that effect. 
Okay. Uh, anybody else? <coughs> Director Tice? Uh, while we're at it, <coughs> the, um, uh, the, all the roads classified as 8F and, and, and how those are managed by the private owners that are on living on those. Uh, there's the multi roads that are, that they don't maintain and, uh, and, and how they how private owners are expected to, uh, maintain them and, and, and what arrangements kind of are, happen around the coast to keep these roads maintained because some people aren't. Some people ask Capilano nicely uh, to, to do some grading and sometimes Capilano obliges, sometimes they don't. And so these are, uh, these are some of the, the bigger questions I have around private roads as well as those that Moti doesn't maintain. Director Hiltz. Perhaps something for TAC. The road classifications, is that a place for something that to bring up? I think, uh, I think I would like to start with the rural directors. And, uh, because it is a fairly big topic and TAC doesn't have a lot of time. So if we could, you know, request a luncheon or, a, or, or that to be on the agenda at the next rural directors meeting, that's another... Uh, possibility so thanks okay I saw a bunch of head nodding over there so staff will take that away do you need a motion for that would you like a motion for that I think it would be helpful yes I mean the, sure. the actual mechanism is um, something we've been reviewing uh, given the parking lot items for example that were provided so clear direction on, on how we'd like to the message conveyed and the information obtained would be appropriate. Thank you. Okay. I would like to move that we add uh, private road and unmaintained road issues to the next rural director's meeting. I'll second. Seconded. Any comments? Director Seegers? I don't know if that actually captures all that you were talking about, because you're also talking about how is a road designated 8F or whatever the designation is, and then who's responsible for maintenance of that? Director Tice. <clears throat> Maybe and that um, a representative from uh, Moti is invited to attend that meeting? Sounds like an amendment. Second the amendment. Seconded. Questions on the amendment? Discussion? All those in favor? No, no rural, right. Um, the motion as amended. Any further questions, comments? All in favor? Great. Okay. Director Lee. I'd like to, I'd like to uh, discuss the uh, item on page 346 of, the, of uh, the Area A APC minutes. And it is that the APC recommended that the SCRD give consideration to hosting an information session with planners uh, repairing professional surveys, coast APCs, to identify and clarify issues affecting setbacks. They were talking about all setbacks, side yards, front yards, um, too close to the lake, all that kind of stuff. I think they were looking to uh, basically, more importantly, educate themselves on the issues as, a, as an information session. I was wondering what, uh, if, uh, if other rural areas had the same thoughts that we need that, or? Director Seegers. Thank you. Um, I'm going to throw this over to staff. There is, what is it called, the Sunshine Coast Planning Institute or something? Sunshine Coast Chapter of the Planning Institute mm -hmm. right, of BC. I'm wondering if this would be something that they could consider taking on to educate all of the APCs, District of Seashell, Town of Gibsons, you know, all the electoral area areas, because setbacks are setbacks. Um, there could be something, I mean, they just did something recently for the public, right? So is that something that could be put over to them? Staff? Uh, thank you for the question, Chair. As a member, but not on, <laughs> of that uh, chapter, but not a decision maker on a on the executive for that group, uh, 
my comment would be that it certainly would be in scope and might be of interest to um, a broader audience than just APCs. Um, the question of resourcing would come up, and if it's uh, if there's a registration fee in order to make the such an event sustainable, that might uh, <laughs> might reduce attendance. Round two budget proposal. <laughs> Ignore him. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Not to dismiss the prior suggestion, because uh, definitely there's a partnership opportunity there. But from time to time, staff do provide uh, orientation activities for APCs. And um, as we come into a new year with potential new appointments, um, this is something that could be considered in the scope of our regular orientation activities. Um, perhaps with a, an eye to opportunities to expand them or look at partnerships uh, to deliver more value to the community for the work that staff already do as a matter of course to build the capacity of our APCs. Director Seegers. Yeah, I, I wasn't dismissing what you were saying either. I was just trying to think how how we could actually put something together. There's, I mean, there's a lot of expertise in the planning departments up and down the coast. And, I mean, setbacks is probably something that all the planning departments continually encounter with residents in, our, in the communities as well, right? So, I mean, one was just this variance that we passed today about yeah. the setback isn't right. So, you know, there's impacts. We just have to give it some more thought to figure out how we could put that together. But it's a great idea. Do you want to make a recommendation or just stick a pin in I, it for I now? Don't, yeah, I'd just stick a pin in it for now. I don't know. I don't know which one of you was first. Director Pratt. Yeah, I was going to say yes, we do. I would agree. We have a lot of expertise along the planning departments, typically because the SCRD has trained them. <laughs> um, and I'd be happy to support uh, like a community education effort. And there's probably a couple of other education opportunities, maybe even potentially with uh, Capilano. And yeah, I just couldn't resist. So thanks. Right? <laughs> oh, three at least. Directly. I was wondering if we could just make like a recommendation that staff have a look and give us some ideas on how we might be able to uh, get this accomplished in the most cost effective way and uh, actually bring them back. You know, don't spend a lot of time, but just give us some ideas on what we could talk about, consider. Sounded like a recommendation. I'll, se there. I'll second that one. <laughs> Did you catch yeah, that? Yeah, whatever I said. Yeah. Okay. Any other comment? Oh, staff? Thank, thank you, Chair. Staff are looking for clarity in the hopes of being able to provide uh, the committee what they would like. What staff heard there was direction to include information about setbacks in APC orientation upcoming APC orientation, and secondly, to look at opportunities to uh, provide information to the community. Thanks. Is that clear enough? Like you like it? Does staff like it, though? <laughs> Well, second drafts are always better. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Chair. Simil uh, uh, provide similar information to the, to the community through an education opportunity, something like that. Um, staff are taking notes from the conversation, so along with the motion, I uh, have lots to work from. Thank you. Perfect. Director Seegers. Yeah, I understand the APC piece, right? But if we look at our process, that's too late. They need to have the information, yes. But if we can actually educate the population, they're the ones putting stuff together and putting plans together. If they have an understanding about it, it actually would lessen what issues we have to deal with at APC and at board and planning, etc. So it's getting out in front of it. Right. Go ahead, Director Lee. Did, did that motion cover that aspect? 
I, I would I was thinking that is exactly what we need, and I think our, us, our, us ourselves would be a, one of the audiences as well. Yeah. Okay, so I'll make that motion. It's, been, it's already on the floor, and yeah, um, and last chance. Anybody else? All those in favor? Great. Anything else out of APCs? Director very, very quickly, just bringing back the note about uh, the invasive species is um, um, Area B is uh, really every every chance they get, they're talking to me about it. So, moving on, uh, Annex X. We've got uh, communications here, page three sixty. Director Ties. All right, um, I'd just like to make a motion that uh, staff prepare a report uh, on the possibilities of renaming the Halkett Bay Dock. Come forward to a future committee meeting? For, come forward to a future committee meeting, yeah. Seconded or comment? Seconded and then an amendment, possibilities and process. I'll move that amendment. <laughs> okay. Director Lee? Oh, I was just told. Okay. In favor of the amendment? Great. Um, opposed? No. Okay. Hey, am I allowed to vote? No, you're not. Does staff have something to say? BDEF. Yeah. Oh, I can't make the amendment. make the amendment either. Okay. It's backed all right up again. I'm sorry about that. Okay. You'll make the amendment. You'll second the amendment. Let's try that again. All those in favor? Of the amendment. Of the amendment. Thank you. Can you repeat it? I did not catch it. Um, and staff, did you have some of this? Uh, for the committee's consideration, the as the ports division is extremely um, lean <laughs> uh, and has activities mostly focused on maintenance and capital um, repairs. And appreciating that the, the concern brought uh, to the regional district's attention is a community concern, um, this might be an opportunity for a community partnership where the, um, the Furcom Sunset Owner Society could conduct further research, um, including engaging other area residents and owners um, about the process and implications. It's not an area that the regional district has experience with or knowledge of, and uh, might be an opportunity to harness interest that's in the community and stretch our limited resources it's for the committee's consideration. Director Ties, Director Pratt. Well, I think maybe we should vote this down then, and then, uh, and then just say that staff contact the whoever sent the letter and say uh, can you please do the research <laughs> director Pratt um, I was going to say the the same thing actually so but I, I would I would defer to the uh, director from this area yeah. thanks for the deferment um, um, well, it, it is an ongoing issue. The, the background, the, the residents are mostly concerned from a uh, emergency preparedness. Um, there are, in uh, the 911 system, there are these aliases which are in there, and that hasn't been verified. Um, so that's something uh, that could be the emergency services, um, just to verify that information. Um, the, the history of it, um, the, the actual tenure that the SERD holds is actually Furcom Bay. And that's the actual name of, the, of where the tenure is actually held. So Halkett is kind of a historical name that kind of is, was with the dock. And the confusion has come about since 1989 when the Provincial Marine Park was called Halkett Bay. So. Um, it's it's and there's a road there named Furcom Road, so um, the the residents mostly are concerned ab about the emergency services. So they, if they pick up 911 and they call and they can say where are you, they'll say Halk at Bay, um, and there's confusion over that. This is this is the issue. Even even for marine operators, this is what people are concerned with. Um, 
so the staff resources. Um, I, I would think that Pomo would be a good place to have a discussion at least about the, the dot naming as, a, as the corp incorporated within an existing um, process that we already have. Um, uh, the idea of the residents, the residents don't really care what name it is. Um, it is in Squamish territory as well. Um, so these are sort of the background issues. So we can call the question, allow it to fail, yeah. and then make another motion to um, just reply back to the, the letter writer and it's either that or we amend it, but I mean, amending it changes the, um, changes the, uh, yeah. changes the purpose of the motion, so. Director Seegers. I understand the, the concern that staff have for the limited resources, but I'm looking at this now from the perspective of the residents on the island. If they try to call anybody and say, how do we go about changing the name on this, what are they going to be told? You don't own it. The regional district own it, owns it. The regional district has to be the one who, who proposes a change, a name change. So I don't know how far they're going to get, right? So I understand, you know, putting it back on them, but I, they may or may not get anywhere with it. And it's probably going to end up back in our hands anyway. Everyone's looking at me. I don't know. I can't even vote on this. Um, <laughs> can um, can you just read the, the motion for now? Sorry. Sorry. And that staff prepare a report on the possibilities and process for renaming the Hellcat Bay Dock. Go for it. And I think this probably would be best directed to uh, Sherry as corporate officer, because there will be a process. I remember when we renamed Fair Lake, right? It was Wormy Lake before, it became Fair Lake. It was, there was actually a process, a provincial process, that we had to go through to change it. So I don't know if that's what we have to do here. Director McMahon. Yeah, we might refer it to Matt Trait to regarding the uh, 911 question. Director Pratt. We also have a big issue because this is a navigational um, uh, interest, so then we have another layer of government on this as well. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so there's there's a whole other piece of this. So, um, so the motion, as we've put forward, I would look to staff to say, is that sufficient based on the conversation we've had? Um, or would you like, is what would you like to see or hear? And you're welcome to be frank. It's fairly open-ended. You can just stick it to whoever's not here today. <laughs> <laughs> but if you've got something to add. Thank you, staff are clear. And no concerns. Okay. Call on the question. Um, B, D, E, and F, all those in favor? Great, perfect. That's done. Um, in camera session. Um, after the board? It should be quick. It should be quick. Um, motion to go in camera uh, and then read the block, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, that the public be excluded from attendance at the meeting in accordance with section 90, uh, 1 A and E of the community charter, personal information about an identifiable individual who holds or is being considered for a position as an officer, employee, or agent, and the acquisition, disposition, or expropriation of land or improvements. Questions from the press? Moved, seconded. All those in favor? Great. Questions? <laughs> 